Welcome to Save As Ability, a podcast to educate and inform you about disability employment issues. My name is David Darkangelo, and I'm your disability policy expert. Hey, everybody. It's great to be back with you, David Darkangelo, another episode of Save As Ability. We've been getting a great response so far. Please help us keep it going. Like, subscribe, share, so we can keep this content coming for you. So what I'd like to do is going forward, actually go back this episode, and I'd like to talk a little bit of a brief history of disability policy and programs in the United States. Uh, Many people have asked for, well, how do you get to this? How do you get to that? Well, it's all based in these things that we're going to go over here today briefly. Uh, First, a little bit of a disclaimer. I want you to recognize that some of the terms we're going to use here are the original terms. Those may be inappropriate or insensitive today. So I don't want you to think I'm being inappropriate or insensitive because I love people with disabilities, obviously. Uh, But I do think it's appropriate to keep the historical context. So we're going to do that. But just if everybody can know that ahead of time. And what I've done is I've essentially broken the history down into like four main segments. The first one being the founding of America up until like the earliest 20th century. The next being a fallout from the Civil War all the way to like World War II, because that was so much disability that happened there. And then from World War II to the Civil Rights Act and ADA, and then really from the ADA Amendments Act up till now. All right. So I've basically broken it down into like four kind of increments. All right. So first, From our founding, if you look back, much of it started, I'm here in Massachusetts and proudly to say that John Adams, President John Adams, back in 1798, signed the first military disability law, an act for the relief of sick and disabled seamen. All right. That was 1798. So, I mean, we're really going back here. That is pretty much the first disability law on the books. Okay. Uh, So then in 1805, American Psychiatry gets founded by Dr. Benjamin Rush. He publishes an influential paper called Medical Inquiries and Observations. And that's really some of the first documentation about mental illness and and other disabilities. So uh, then you go up to 1829 and you have uh, Louis Braille. Louis Braille invents Braille, which is the raised alphabet system for blind people. And then... uh, That same year, founded in Watertown, you have the Perkins School for the Blind. So now you can see like blindness starting to get introduced into education and the laws, how they're first starting. That takes us to like 1860s when the Civil War really was getting ready to to happen there. Uh, Gallaudet University is founded. That's a very important school for the deaf in Washington, D.C. That was authorized by Congress and President Lincoln signed it in to grant college degrees to people with deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, And then the Civil War happens from 1860, 1861, really, I think probably officially to 1865. Uh, 38,000 amputations alone to the U.S. Army. I can't even imagine the level of devastation in the Civil War and the amount of disability that that brought. Uh, But really, that was like the impetus to then get some laws on the books to start protecting those people. And we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. So, uh, again, prideful here in Boston in 1872, Alexander Graham Bell, the scientist, the inventor. And yeah, he's a little controversial on his views on eugenics, which I don't agree with, by the way. Uh, But, you know, he really worked on the invention of the telephone to support communication with his wife and deaf mother. So really his experimentation with these hearing devices maybe you know led to innovation that turned into the telephone. So that's important because many of the things that we talk about with people with disabilities, many of the inventions and discoveries and things like that often have a link to disability. So uh, in 1880, Helen Keller is born and she becomes the first deaf blind person to graduate college and write a book. She pridefully, she was also a founding member of the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. She was one of the first three original commissioners. I'm uh, one of the most recent commissioners. So. 
1892, the American Psychological Association is founded. Then we hit a really difficult time in these late 1880s and early 1890s where there's laws being passed, but they're not good laws for people with disabilities. They're called the ugly laws. This is really a difficult time throughout American history where uh, in 1889, the first ugly law was enacted in Denver, Colorado, and Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, ugly laws were enacted in Columbus, Ohio in 1894. An ugly law was enacted in the state of Pennsylvania. The language contained within these bills was really kind of nasty, and it applied particularly to people with cognitive disabilities, but also for people with physical disabilities. Uh, I don't want to go too much into it. Ugly law says enough. Bad part of American history. But we did start to learn from that, and we did start to form governmental organizations that were now going to protect people with disabilities or set out protections in the law and in programs for people with disabilities. In 1906, Mass Commission of the Blind is formed. And again, as I mentioned, Helen Keller is one of the first members. So that's really one of the first agencies, governmental agencies put in place. And there were similar ones in Connecticut and in, in other places in New England and throughout, the, uh, throughout America that really put programs in place for people with disabilities of uh, blindness and deafness and other physical disabilities as well. So, but again, I, we were still kind of feeling our way as a country on what to do and how to handle people with disabilities and treat people with disabilities. In 1907, there was the terrible eugenic sterilization law uh, in Indiana, and that was, you know, passing a st sterilization law for uh, I don't even like mentioning, but it was just very, the language is very offensive to people with cognitive disabilities. Very challenging. More challenges came when disease swept through that we didn't have cures for, which still medicine was still, you know, developing. In 1916, the polio epidemic swept through the United States and there was something like 28,000 cases of polio within a certain amount of time, 6,000 deaths. A large amount of those, a high percentage of people with polio that experience permanent physical disabilities um, through polio. So that was very challenging. All right. So now we switch gears. That was kind of like the early part of the United States. Now, as we go into uh, post-Civil War, into World War II, so basically like 1900 to like 1960 is this next area we're going to be talking about. Well, in 1936, Congress passes the Social Security Act. That act provides for the general welfare and establishment of a system for federal old age benefits. 1935. If I were to tell you that many of the provisions put in that place, put in place at that time to that law, which is now 90, almost 90 years old, were still in place today, would you be surprised? We'll, we'll get back to that actually in future episodes that we're going to explore how we can reform and improve. Uh, programs for people with disabilities. But really, this law is important because it really gave a large amount of government resources or devoted rather, rather than get devoted a large amount of government resources for people with disabilities. And it explicitly named aged persons, blind persons, dependent. Um, again, here's a very insensitive word now, but at the time, crippled children, that was in the law, maternal and child welfare, public health, I'm reading right from it. So uh, you can see even how the language has changed. So you can see how the laws were being put in place to, to be able to provide resources, our country, for, for people with disabilities, okay? And that happened over the next couple of dozen years and really a couple of decades throughout World War II. Now, naturally, war, unfortunately, brings a significant amount of disabilities, and what happened during World War II was hundreds of thousands of individuals because of the war were now brought into disability, whereas they started their life, you know, without any disability. But because of the war, they now have a disability, either a physical disability and particularly the cognitive disabilities, which many at the time went undiagnosed for years because of the trauma that those individuals experienced. All right, so now it's post-war. Now let's talk about another era. 
going into the civil rights era. So now I would consider this era between like 1960 and 1990, like that 30 year span. We really saw major legislation devoted specifically for the civil rights of people with disabilities. So it starts in 1965 with the Social Security Amendments Act. That establishes Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare, that medical insurance program for people over 65 and younger disabled people. Now, we've talked about before, a lot of people with disabilities are aging into disabilities. So if you're getting into your later 60s, early 70s, the incidence of disability tends to rise. All right. But again, Medicare also includes younger disabled people as well. And then Medicaid, which is the assistance program for low income people and people with various medical expenses, also then covered people with disabilities. All right. And just as of now, not 1965 data, but data from now, we've got about 10 million people who qualify for Medicaid. And of that, a significant amount are people with disabilities. We know that from the data. We'll get into that in future episodes. But moving forward to 1973, we're talking about the Rehabilitation Act. All right. Now, we're going to go also back and talk about the Civil Rights Act in another episode, because that then protected all the diversity categories of, of race and other, uh, other minority groups. Okay. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the 73 Rehabilitation Act, which was really a monumental act for people with disabilities for a couple different reasons. One, it put in place prohibitions against discrimination and retaliation against qualified people with disabilities. So before we had the ADA definition of disability, we had this important definition of qualified person with a disability contained within the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Also of significance in the Rehab Act is the sections that it lays out, which really was kind of like a precursor to the titles of the ADA, if you can think about it in a little bit of a, a parallel. But like Section 501 prohibited discrimination in the federal sector. 503 prohibited employers with federal contracts from discrimination. 504 was federal financial assistance. So if you were getting any federal financial assistance, you couldn't discriminate against people with disabilities. Section 508, which was relative to information technology, not to be confused with WCAG, which is a private thing. We'll get into that in a future episode as well. And then the Rehab Act also established the Rehabilitation Services Administration. All right. So really, you saw a large amount during that era of laws being passed, of civil rights being advanced for people with disabilities, all the way up until what I would consider like the present era, which to me starts with the ADA. So the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act signed by President Bush, uh, really a bipartisan law meant to improve uh, outcomes for people with disabilities. And really, it's a civil rights law intended to lay out clear anti-discrimination parameters for people with disabilities, okay? Uh, before that, just before that, and really one of the drivers of it, the impetus of it, proudly, I used to be on the National Council on Disability. In 1988, the National Council on Disability uh, published the threshold to independence, and really that prompted the Congressional Task Force to be able to put in place to work on the ADA. So again, in, in 1990, the ADA laid out its five titles, which we've talked about. Uh, but then we realized that the ADA was, there was some implementation problems with it. So we had to do the ADA Amendments Act. Uh, but before we did that, the Supreme Court issued their Olmstead decision. This was in 1999. And that basically said that there was unjustified institutional isolation of people with disabilities. And that made all of the programs have to provide uh, programs and services to people with disabilities in a community setting, in an integrated community setting, and not just isolate people with disabilities and all of the terrible institutionalization that occurred and things like that. So that Supreme Court decision, Olmstead, was really important. That happened in 1999. Uh, in 2004, NCD issued the report uh, urging the president and Congress to restore the original intent of the ADA 
that had narrowed the scope of the ADA's protection. So that's really when we see the beginnings of the ADA Amendments Act, which was passed in 2008, which really put teeth back into the ADA and gave more of a clear road path, roadmap on how to be able to interpret and implement the Americans with Disabilities Act, again, 2008. Also in 2008, the United States Census Bureau first starts asking questions about disabilities. So now we can actually get data about people with disabilities uh, in all aspects of life. So then in 2010, the ADA Standards Act for Accessible Design goes in place. The US DOT issues passenger vehicle regulations. So now you can really see that the, the, the start of the civil rights is now going towards implementation and all of the finer points of uh, protection for people with disabilities. And then one of the most recent ones in 2014 was the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act, or WIOA. And that requires states to coordinate and align with all of the stuff that we've just talked about for people with disabilities. So this is only a brief history of the law, of the major laws uh, encountering people with disabilities, involving people with disabilities in the United States. So I'm sure I left a ton out. Really just trying to give you all an understanding that we, the United States, your Congress, your president, your elected officials, have been working on these issues for decades. We continue to try to refine it. We continue to try to improve this, uh, th these policies for people with disabilities to make sure that we're not discriminating, to make sure that we're providing access to opportunities. Uh, there's been many instances where we've got it right and others where we haven't, and many more that we're going to talk about in the future about how we can reform and modernize many of these programs to really include as many people as we can, because there is talent out there in these people with disabilities that are our sons and daughters. It's, our, it's us. It's part of America. It's part of our stories. So I hope that overview helped you understand that we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go but we try our best. So it's David Darkangelo. Thank you again. Please like, subscribe, and share so we can keep this content coming. I hope you have a great day. For more information about disability employment issues, please visit our website, disabilityemploymentsolutions.com. The Save As Ability podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel at Disability Policy Expert or wherever you stream your podcasts. Subscribe, stream, rate, and review our shows. Your ratings and reviews help our show reach new audiences. Produced by Pod Pro Entertainment. Save As Ability lives within a network of podcasts located at podproentertainment.com. Hashtag the new radio. Again, my name is David Darkangelo, and I'm your disability policy expert. Until next time, thank you. I hope you have a great day.